In 2006, I was a college student in ASU. I lived in an off-campus apartment on the ground floor. It was about a block off a major street here in Phoenix. These details are important. In the summer of 2006, Phoenix, Arizona was plagued by two serial killers. One was the Phoenix Shooter, who ended up being a team of two guys, randomly shooting people. The other was a baseline killer, a rapist and murderer. As you can imagine, having two serial killers at once put the whole city on edge, and everyone was talking about it. I even saw articles in Time or Newsweek about the situation. In the fall of 2006, investigations had just really started heating up. Now, you may have heard this, but Phoenix is very hot in August. It would get stuffy in my apartment. It would get stuffy in my apartment, so I'd leave the window cracked open a little. The morning air was nice. The blinds provided cover anyway. One morning, a strange sound woke me up, though. It was at the crack of dawn, at around 4.45 a.m. or so. The sun was just barely coming up. The sound was a tapping sound. It seemed to be intentional, not caused by a tree branch or something. I thought it could be a bird or some sort of animal, something trivial. I ignored it and went to grab a beer instead. After about 90 seconds of silence, though, the tapping returned, and it was absolutely purposeful now. That was, clist that was crystal clear. In my mind, I thought it could possibly be my boyfriend, who thought it was very cute to try and scare me sometimes. I decided I'd be a bit of a brat and make him wait, but I was also getting really angry. How dare he pull a prank like this when I'm trying to sleep? This is just like him. I was going to have to give him a real piece of my mind about disturbing my resting time like this. The sounds continued. At a certain point, I got up to get a glass of water, still being in the mindset that my first priority was to annoy my stupid boyfriend by ignoring him. He thought this would be funny, so not giving him a reaction would be the best revenge. Out of the corner of my eye, though, I saw some movement through the slit in the blinds. I marched over and yanked the blinds open. I was having enough of this now. I could see now, though, it was definitely not my boyfriend. I was so surprised, I remember yelling out, What the fuck? The guy seemed sort of taken aback by my anger, but only slightly. The man I saw outside will be in my brain forever, more specifically his eyes. And the feeling they gave me was insanely creepy. Honestly, words can't do justice to how bizarre his eyes looked. They were so dilated, they were almost like black orbs, with no whites in them at all. They were absolutely predatory. When I see pictures of Ted Bundy or Charles Manson, that's exactly what he looked like. Even if you saw a picture, it looks different than when you experience it in person. He was crouched down like an umpire or something. He had dark pants, a dark purple shirt, and a dark hat on. He had dark skin as well. I thought he might have been Hispanic, but I later found out he was a very light-skinned black guy. You'll know how I learned his name later. Anyway, after I yelled out the what the fuck at him, he whispered into me. Can I talk to you for a moment? If you want to know how insanely creepy it is to just hear that sentence, allow yourself to picture it right now. In the darkness, all alone with this guy outside your window, it sends chills down my spine when I think about how it sounded. His hands subtly moved towards his waist. I would later learn that he would blitz attack his victims, and he probably had a gun on him. Now, this was about a three-second interaction at this point. For some reason, I thought about Ted Bundy and how he pretended to be crippled to target his victims. I thought about my mom telling me not to be nice to strangers and don't be afraid to be a bitch. My thinking wasn't as calculated as all that, but it was more of the nano-processing of how I was dealing with the situation. When he whispered, I started yelling at him. Hell no! Get the fuck out of there, douchebag! I smacked the window angrily. I guess the man decided not to try me any further. I laid back down and wondered what that had all been about. 
What if he needed help or something? But then why would he be tapping and whispering if he was in trouble? He was definitely a creep. I was too annoyed to get back to sleep. I told my roommate about this about an hour later, and she sort of jokingly asked if it could have been the baseline killer. When she said that, my heart sank. His face looked exactly like the police sketches that were on the billboards everywhere. The only problem was those billboards had him with dreads. The man at my window had no dreads at all. Apparently, he was some sort of disguise artist who'd wear wigs to avoid being caught. I called the Phoenix police, and the detective I talked to agreed it sounded like his M.O. The suspect would say something to throw off his target, then he'd blitz attack them. The detective said that my angry response had probably made me seem like too much a hassle to actually attack, and so the man moved on. There were some slight problems with the fact I thought the man looked Hispanic when the detective said many witnesses had described him as black. I thought they might want to come out and try samples of surveillance video or something, but I didn't hear back from them for a while. My parents freaked out. They got me pepper spray. We tried to leave the apartment complex, and we learned another tenant had complained about the exact same thing. I never learned the full details, but apparently this idiot was going around the whole damn complex trying to find a new target. The stupid apartment wouldn't let us out of our lease, so we moved to a second floor apartment right above our old unit. The neighbors who moved into our old one were obnoxious tweakers who would do meth and play pitbull on repeat for hours and have night fights at 11am on weekdays. Honestly, there were times I wondered if that might have been a worse experience than the actual serial killer who came to my window. Perhaps that unit was cursed somehow or something. Anyway, on the 4th of September 2006, they finally arrested the guy. I think the detective hadn't called me back in all that while because they were only days away from arresting him. When I saw his mugshot, I was sick, but I was also relieved. That was absolutely the guy from outside my window. He definitely looked like he could have been Hispanic. You can judge it for yourself if you Google his name. He's on death row in Arizona now. His wife tried to mount some campaigns to show how the police were framing him or something. On a personal level, that would certainly make for an interesting coincidence if they had framed an innocent guy who was caught whispering like a creep and tapping on people's windows in the night. The other cool thing about this story is that I had a real bad eating disorder at the time. About eight months after this happened, I got a solid recovery going. I never would have experienced how wonderful life could be if things hadn't changed that morning in 2006. I can't think of anything scarier than a serial killer tapping on your window. That actually happened to me. If something similar happens to you, try your best to scare them or act crazy. Don't be afraid to be downright rude to someone who's injecting themselves into your space. It could save your life if you make yourself look like more trouble than you're worth. Don't be afraid to throw your weight around and tell someone off. During some cave exploring, my family and some friends were in some very deep caves. As we were starting to head back out, we found a little layer about knee-high in the rock. There was an area that was a tight squeeze, but if you got onto your stomach, you could shimmy into it. It led into a small crawl space in a rock cavern, with moss growing on the ceiling, and this beautiful crystal display all over the walls. We went in one by one. If you were claustrophobic, this place was basically your worst nightmare. Most times, you could almost feel the ceiling on your back, and the floor on your stomach, too. Everyone took a prayer as we went deeper in. It was so incredible. Like this small treasure tucked away within a wall of solid rock, I had made it as deep in as I could go before the path wore down to the left. It was covered with stalagmites and stalactites made of sediment. Everyone was having a grand time taking in these beautiful sights. That was until we started to feel trickles of water running down our backs. Turns out it had just started raining outside. 
with the way this crawl space dipped down before flattening out, the whole place would fill with rainwater pretty damn quickly. Unfortunately for us too, the only way back out was the way we'd come in in the first place. The water started to trickle down before it soon turned into full-on streams. The little cavern began to fill up. Being the furthest away from the exit, all I could do was wait for everyone else to crawl flat on their stomach with the jagged crystals pointing down from the ceiling at their backs. I started to panic. Everyone else crawled out as fast as they could as the water began really streaming in. The flow of water was growing larger and larger. Everyone exited one at a time, as fast as they could, but it was not fast enough for me. I could feel the water rising up to my chin level. As I crawled behind my brother, each inch I took forward felt so painfully slow. I could almost feel the walls compressing around me. The water was unrelenting, now splashing hard against me. My panicked squirms just barely managed to get me up and out of the water, just as it was rising over my lips. Thankfully, everyone got out safely, but I'm not eager to try something like that ever again. I was roughly eight or nine at the time of this incident, I remember the attachable LCD screen for the PS1 had just come out, which I guess would put this around 2001 or so. My mother, older brother and I took a trip one afternoon to our local Toys R Us. My brother and I would typically skip the rest of the store and head straight for the video game section. I guess my mom thought the store was safe enough to leave us in that area while she looked around the other sections. This area was pretty well lit and had its own checkout counter and attendance as well. It would have been very stupid for a potential creeper to attempt to grab a kid under those circumstances. But you know, some of these sickos tend to premeditate all about this. My brother and I split up to check out the newest games, and after a few minutes, I noticed some random guy was talking to my brother, someone who was definitely not an employee. He was a tall Caucasian guy with a slim build, gray hair and a buzz cut, and seemed to be in his 40s or 50s. They talked for a minute, then the guy went about his business. I went up to my brother and asked him what this strange man had wanted. My brother was more quiet than usual. He simply stated that the man had offered to buy him anything he wanted from the store if he did the man a favor in return. When I asked what that was, my brother did not respond. I guess as a kid, I couldn't really fathom the man's true intentions. I honestly thought he was genuinely going to buy a gift and leave us alone forever. The only thing running through my head was to grab the most expensive game console I could and find the guy again. As you can imagine, I was very naive. My brother knew better, thankfully. He grabbed my arm and told me to forget about that devil's deal. He dragged me towards our car. A little while later, I looked at the adjacent street and spotted the man again. I pointed towards him and told my mom about what happened earlier. The man was just staring at us. He drove away in his jeep, possibly still reeling from almost getting caught. Looking back, I'm glad the man didn't approach me instead. I'm not sure I would have been as smart and quick thinking as my brother was. Last Thanksgiving, my boyfriend and I loaded our two-month-old daughter into our car and drove from Miami to Naples to visit my family. Being new parents who were extremely nervous about taking such a lengthy trip with the baby, we prepared for every possible scenario. We left shortly after 12, my boyfriend behind the wheel. We hit the highway, which was swollen with holiday traffic. After about an hour of driving, the baby became quite fussy. We pulled over at a rest stop to feed her and change her diaper. While I was changing her, my boyfriend stood outside the car stretching when suddenly he called my name. 
Peering outside the car, I looked across the street in the direction he was pointing, only to see a clown standing there with a big purple star painted over his face. He had wild, crazy, unkempt black hair and a purple and white checkered outfit. He was standing on the opposite side of the parking lot, waving to people as they pulled in and out of the rest stop. I chuckled and returned to what I was doing, unbothered by this clown. Honestly, I figured it was some sort of promotion. As we pulled out of the station, the clown waved at us as well. I gave a lazy acknowledgement back just before my boyfriend took his foot off the brake and eased into traffic. The clown gave me the most hungry and sinister smile I had ever seen and shouted out, You would look amazing draped over my lap. Even through the closed car window, I heard him quite clearly. Wow, what a creep. As we drove away, I repeated what the clown had said to my boyfriend, who hadn't quite caught what he was saying. For a few minutes, he was dead set on turning around to confront this creeper clown, but I told him that obviously wasn't worth it. We still had a long drive ahead of us. We arrived in Naples shortly after 2.30, and by then, I had already forgotten about the previous incident. I didn't even bring it up to my parents. We had a great time at my parents' place, and ended up leaving close to 11.30 at night, much later than we'd originally intended. My parents tried to convince us to stay, but while we had plenty of stuff for the baby with us, we hadn't packed any overnight things for ourselves. We decided to just commit to the drive back home. Besides, we figured that there would be a lot less traffic out now, and it would take a much shorter amount of time to get home. My boyfriend had been driving for about 45 minutes when he asked me if I wouldn't mind taking over. He was having a hard time keeping his eyes focused. I told him to pull over at the next rest area, and I would take the wheel. After a few minutes, we see a sign for a rest area up ahead and pull in to this one. Mind you, it was not the same rest stop as the one before. It had no bathrooms, vending machines, or anything. It was basically just a long parking lot with one row of parking spaces, which looped back onto the road. My boyfriend pulled the car into a spot nose first, so it was facing a long chain-link fence. In the area beyond it, there was just trees and what looked to be a big swamp. I couldn't see anything specific in the glow of the headlights. He put the car in park and left the engine running and the lights on as he climbed out of the driver's seat. The baby started to fuss as soon as the car stopped moving. I climbed out of the passenger seat and opened the back door to check on her. My boyfriend climbed into the spot I'd just vacated and immediately shut his eyes. After I confirmed the baby was fine and would probably fall back asleep soon, I shut the back door and made my way over to the driver's seat. That's when I heard the sound of the chain-link fence in front of us rattling and something being dragged across the metal links, steadily drawing closer. I turned in the direction of this noise, and for a split second I only noticed the dark outline of a figure on the opposite side of the fence. They stepped into the light of our headlights, and I now saw. It was the exact same clown from the previous rest stop, Except this time, he had a large red stain splattered across his purple and white costume and was dragging a broken beer bottle across the fence. He pressed his face directly into the gaps in between and smiled at me. He cackled. Hello again. He started making lewd gestures with his tongue. I was at a loss for words. It was so unbelievably surreal that I could only really stare at him in disbelief. In horror, not knowing whether I should be truly afraid or start laughing at the absurdity of this situation. My boyfriend sat up in the passenger seat and screamed to get going. The baby started crying out. The sound could be heard across the silent parking lot. The clown then immediately started singing a lullaby in a grotesque, uneven voice. My parents had given us a set of fancy glasses for our dining room table. My boyfriend opened the door for a brief moment and launched one directly at the clown. The glass shattered against the chain-link fence and sprayed tiny razor projectiles all over the clown. He hissed and immediately booked it to the end of the fence. 
Me and my boyfriend slammed our car door shut to make sure they were closed and locked them fully. I threw the car into reverse and backed out of the spot. As we put the car back in drive, I could see the clown charging towards us from across the parking lot. My boyfriend yelled at me to run him over, but I swerved to avoid him and floored it out of the area and back onto the highway. For the next several minutes, my heart was racing, convinced that at any moment a speeding car would come up behind us and try to run us off the road or something. Fortunately, that never happened. We were so shaken and traumatized that all we could do for the rest of the way home was ask each other over and over again what the hell had just happened. We could only speculate as to what the guy was doing out there at 12 a.m., dressed like a clown in the middle of the Everglades. Especially on Thanksgiving night, we considered that he was just trying to mess with people, but you would need some serious balls to pull that kind of stunt in the Everglades. The people that live around here don't put up with that kind of nonsense. And even if he was trying to prank someone or something, what was he doing there hiding behind a dark fence in front of a swamp? Waiting for a completely random car to show up so he could traumatize them? I don't know if the stain on his suit was blood or something, but it definitely made us feel threatened enough that we felt justified throwing something at him. Seeing as how his response was to charge immediately, I suspect his intentions were hostile from the very beginning. The fact we had seen him earlier that day made the situation even worse because it almost felt like he was stalking us. My boyfriend has a license to carry a gun, so all I can say is it's a good thing he wasn't packing that particular night. Halloween night on a boat doesn't seem like the best way to spend your night, but my boyfriend really wanted to go, and I'm terrible at saying no to him. We were supposed to be in costume, but I was already dreading the night enough without having to be in an uncomfortable and probably itchy outfit all night long. I was just going to make my boyfriend happy anyway. The night ended up very differently than what we had initially planned, or than I had hoped though. We arrived at the docks about 30 minutes early to make sure we got a good spot on the boat. They were selling tickets right then and there, so if you showed up too late, you wouldn't be able to go. We got on board, and I saw it was already packed with people that were drunk and acting like idiots. I was not at all excited for the night to come. I've always been an introvert at heart, and my boyfriend at the time was extremely extroverted. Pretty much the whole opposites attract sort of thing, I guess. Looking back now, he really should have understood how uncomfortable that night would make me. We could have compromised and done something both of us would enjoy, but with him it was all about what he wanted the most. Most of the night I would spend sitting at a table, just waiting for it to be over. My boyfriend had ditched me immediately the second he saw one of his friends was there. It was proving to be just as horrible a night so far as I thought it would be. We were a mile off the coast now, and I had nowhere else to go. Then, to make things even worse, the boat suddenly stopped. The lights went out, the music stopped, people started to boo like it had been done on purpose, but I knew immediately there was something wrong. I started asking the crew what was going on, but they didn't seem to know either. Drunk, bored people are the worst people in the world to be around, by the way. A bunch of them thought it would be funny to run from side to side and try to sway the boat. It rocked a little bit, but there wasn't much success at all. The captain came out soon after and made an announcement that they were trying to get help from the Coast Guard, but weren't having much luck getting through to anyone. He told us that we might be there for quite a long while. It was starting to get really cold, and I couldn't find my boyfriend anywhere. It was so dark that all I could see was the glow sticks that people were wearing, or the occasional phone screen lighting up a patch of darkness. I sat down towards the front of the boat, and all I could do was wait. And that's when a man sat down beside me and put his arm around me. With alcohol in his breath, he asked me why I was sitting there all alone. I shoved his arm off me, and stood up to walk away. Apparently, he didn't like that one bit, 
He grabbed me by my wrist and pulled me back down so hard. I thought my tailbone must have broken when I hit the metal deck. He laughed and told me I'd be staying with him for the rest of the night. I was scared and confused, but I knew the night would be over soon enough. The fear I had almost made me not able to move, so I sat there with that man as he gripped my wrist tight. Finally, after a few moments, my boyfriend found me and asked me what I was doing with another guy. I tried telling him what just happened, but he refused to believe me. He actually thought I was cheating on him. Instead of trying to help me, he just walked away. I was immediately devastated. This only made the guy who was holding me think I was his to keep for good. He said that because I was single now, I was his. He even had the audacity to tell me that I'd be going home with him tonight too, just because he said so. I stood up again trying to get away from this psychopath, but this time he jumped up and grabbed me by the waist. He whispered in my ear, If you try to get away from me again, I'll make sure you never make it off this boat. My heart started to race. I knew this was a situation I wasn't meant to be in. There had to be a way to get away from this man. As we were walking through the crowds on the boat, I decided to make a run for it. I punched him in the gut and shoved him away from me. I ran through the sea of people in front of me, eyes wide so I didn't run into anything that would slow me down. Eventually, I found the woman's restroom. I ran inside crying, and the other woman inside asked me what was wrong. I told her about the guy who had been following me. When to my surprise, the man burst through the doors looking for me. None of the women comforting me hesitated for even a moment to jump on top of him. They all tackled him to the ground. It was so dark that I couldn't really see what was happening, but judging by his groaning and screams of pain, it was obvious that whatever they were doing didn't feel so good. I listened and watched as much as I could. I could make out they were throwing punches and kicks at him, hitting him in the head over and over until he was unconscious. As they were dragging him out of the bathroom, the lights turned back on. Everyone turned to look. It must have been a real sight to see, since everyone was surprised when I saw him. He looked much worse than I'd thought he would. I could only see so much in the darkness, but when the lights came back on, it was easy to see the damage they had done. His face had become barely recognizable. His clothes were completely torn apart, almost ripped off his body. He was red from the beating. Obviously, he'd have some bad bruises the next morning. Meanwhile, the captain had gotten a hold of the Coast Guard and the police by using someone's cell phone. He made sure we arrived at the docks as fast as possible to get this guy some medical treatment. Obviously, he'd be needing it. The police were there to meet us when we arrived, and I, along with the woman who kicked the shit out of that guy, were questioned on what happened. Other people who witnessed him holding me down backed up my story. What really concerned me, though, was the fact that they had seen me struggling there with that guy, noticed it was a problem, and none of them did anything at all. The man was put in custody after leaving the hospital and was charged with harassment. They only received 90 days and a small fine of $400. They were also ordered to stay away from me and never contact me again. Of course, the man never admitted to what he did. He denied each and every thing and said I'd made it all up to make him look bad. He even threatened to sue me for a while. There were enough witnesses, though, and everything that I'd said about what happened was proven to be true, that he eventually backed down in the end. I broke up with my boyfriend the night after that boat party, and I haven't spoken to him since, for obvious reasons. More than anything, though, I'm grateful for those women who saved me. They knew I was in trouble, and they didn't hesitate to help me at all. I'm actually still friends with most of them. Every Halloween, we go out together, and we have each other's backs if any of us ever need it. Everyone always tells me it's okay, that I'm being too dramatic, that they're not really bad people, they're just drunk. But parties with my family really ruined my childhood. 
My parents, especially my mother, really liked partying, seeing friends, getting drunk, and the whole package. Nothing special. Yeah, sure, everyone loves having a little fun sometimes, and I can fully understand that. Since I was little though, my mother always had a really close friend. He'd be around 55 now, I guess. He would always come home with his wife and they'd drink a whole lot. Sometimes he'd even do so much his wife would even be ashamed of him. He would get that bad. When all the family was wasted, my mom forced me to join in with them. We're having fun. Come on, don't ruin the party. You're a pain in the ass. Always complaining. What's the problem now? I was the one parenting all of them. I was protecting the dog because they would throw their empty bottles at her. They would pour beer in her bowl and make her drink it. I was warning them over and over because they were getting way too rowdy and drinking way too much. I basically had to babysit them all every time, even though I was only around 11 or 12 years old. One day, I was filming and having fun with my mom's friend. We were having a genuinely nice moment to be honest. It was just me and him and we were dancing. So far, there wasn't really anything weird in this situation. Then he stopped me though and started to say things that scared me real bad. You know I could be your father, right? You're so young. Oh, do you remember when you were a child and you said I was your lover? You said you were in love with me. I didn't know what to say. I felt terribly uncomfortable. He grabbed my butt and whispered in my ear. Oh, you say nothing when I do that, huh? That's not good. Then he just kept on dancing like nothing happened. I did get a recording of this, but I deleted it. I felt too ashamed in that moment. I was feeling stressed, ashamed, bad, scared. I wasn't hiding it either. My mom's friend sent me a message right after this. Are you mad at me? I felt intimidated. No, don't worry. I was about ready to just go to sleep. I told everyone goodbye when that fucking friend grabbed my head and tried to kiss me on the lips. After that, he would stare at me all day long. It was a nightmare. I didn't say anything. I waited for two years before speaking up. The first person I told was my dad. He looked desperate and sad, and then he just walked away without doing anything. I tried to tell my mom, too. At first, I lied and said this had all happened to my best friend. She gave me the whole, he should tell his parents. That's awful. I hope he's doing better now. When I finally told her it happened to me, though, she changed her mind immediately. What? He did that? He was drunk. He didn't mean to do that. Maybe he just touched your hair. Don't tell me he did that to you. He's my best friend. It was two years ago. I mean, he won't remember. Come on, it's nothing. I cried. I just couldn't deal with this anymore. Every time I tried to tell anyone something, I would never be taken seriously. Especially by my family. That's why I stopped telling them altogether and started to avoid them ever since. Maybe they're right, I don't know, but that's not the only thing that's happened since then. I can't even sit next to them during a party. I can't even look at them, simply because I'm so scared. I was only a child back then. Back during the height of the 2016 clown craze, where psychos were dressing up and wandering around wooded rural areas, stalking and terrifying people, I was living in a very isolated and heavily wooded property in Connecticut. My driveway was so long that my house couldn't even be seen from the road. I'd never once had a problem with trespassers before, so my kids were free to play outside in our yard whenever they wished. One afternoon, I was inside the house on a conference call when my eight-year-old daughter suddenly ran inside. She stated that there was a clown in our driveway. For the first several seconds, I was very annoyed. I was convinced she was either playing a joke on me or just seeing things. I excused myself from the call for a moment and asked her what she was doing there. She simply replied, it's pointing at us. Something in the way she said that made a chill run through my spine. 
I stood up and walked out the front door and onto my front steps. My daughter pointed, and as I followed her finger, I indeed did see a figure in a pink and blue striped outfit standing there by the tree line, waving and pointing towards my two other children, who were still close to the house, but calling over to the clown, asking what it wanted. I immediately called my kids back over to me and locked my front door with all of us inside. I told them all to stay put and grabbed my stun gun from its spot. I got into my car and called my husband. As I drove my car out of the garage and down the driveway, I told him what was going on. He told me to keep the car doors locked and not get too close to this clown. I decided, at least for the time being, not to call the police. It would take them more than half an hour to get there anyway, and by that time the clown would likely be long gone. I didn't want to just disappear into the house and wait for the chance this person would get bored either though. I wanted to confront him and tell him to stay the hell away from my property and from my kids. The clown was no longer by the tree line as I left the garage. As I drove further down the driveway, I could see into the trees a short way away. He was jogging at a brisk pace. When he heard my car coming, he stopped and turned around. He looked back towards me. He wasn't wearing a mask, but his face was heavily made up, complete with a clown nose and everything. What really shook me was that he appeared to be holding a croquet mallet in one of his hands. He waved at me before running away into the woods. I slammed my brakes and rolled down my window halfway, screaming at him to get the hell off my property. I floored it to the end of my driveway and drove back and forth in the hopes of finding a parked car with a license plate I could then report. I didn't see anything suspicious or out of place though. I returned home to check on my kids, who were more amused and excited than afraid at all. I kinda kicked myself for not taking a picture of the clown on my phone, just to have a record of it in case I needed to report it and someone didn't believe me. I told my kids they had to stay inside for the rest of the day and figured I would never see this clown again. Whoever it was had clearly gotten his kicks and certainly wouldn't risk trespassing on my property again. The kids were asleep later that night and my husband and I were skimming through Netflix. I got up to let the cat out. I'm not exactly positive on what I saw, but there was definitely something across the yard. I could see the movement out of the corner of my eye. I could also see what I thought was a shadow of something being cast by the moon. Whatever it was soon disappeared around the corner. I turned on all the outside lights. My husband and I looked around, but whatever I had seen it did not reappear. It could have been a deer, I suppose, but I have reason to suspect it was that clown from earlier. That's because the following morning, when I drove my car to the end of the driveway, there was now a purple balloon tied to our mailbox, and a little potted plant at the base of the post had been smashed in, as if something big like a mallet had been brought down on it. Worried the balloon was an indicator of some kind, I immediately untied it and let it fly off into the sky. The rest of that day passed by without incident. By the following afternoon, I'd forgotten all about the clown. That is, until my kids came back inside and told me the clown had returned and was pointing at them again. I yelled at the kids to get inside, but instead of going to my car this time, I grabbed my phone and stun gun and stupidly charged right out the front door. I stomped across the yard, determined to get evidence this time. Hopefully I could stun him and hold him down until the cops came and dragged his ass away. I never saw him that time though. Instead of just keeping my kids shut inside, I loaded them in the car and drove over to my parents. This time they were much more spooked by the clown. I began to become concerned. Perhaps my kids were not safe in the yard anymore. I asked them if it was the same clown as before. They said it was, and that this time instead of a croquet mallet, he was holding a sledgehammer. Now, to be fair, I don't know if that's true or if they just didn't know what a croquet mallet was. The following day, I decided to become a little more proactive. 
my parents let me borrow their black Labrador named Groucho. He was a friendly dog but had a tremendously loud bark and was fiercely protective of the kids. For two days, nothing else happened. I was starting to hope this mysterious clown had moved on to harass someone else. That's when the worst happened, though. I was returning back up the driveway in the car after grabbing the mail. As I was doing so, I noticed something I couldn't believe. The clown was sneaking through the woods. Groucho was in the back seat and immediately started barking, loud enough to almost rupture my eardrums. I slammed on my brakes and immediately called the cops this time. I told them there was a trespasser on my property and he was carrying a weapon. As I was on the phone with the cops, another call came in on my cell from the house. My oldest daughter was crying, saying there was a clown standing on our back deck right outside the sliding door. This one, though, was dressed all in orange with blue face paint. I floored it back to the driveway. I threw my car in park, and when I reached the garage, I noticed the second clown sprinting towards the woods. I opened the rear door, and Groucho tore off after the guy like a ballistic missile. He caught the clown right by the tree line. The guy started screaming as my loyal dog leapt on top of him and tore away at his costume. I distinctly heard two separate male voices yelling in the trees, though I couldn't make out exactly what was being said. My daughter was still on the line and confirmed to me that all the kids were inside. I went after my dog into the woods. When I found Groucho, he was limping slightly. I was infuriated. I saw he'd been stabbed with what could have been an ice pick or a screwdriver. Ultimately, though, he seemed pretty unbothered by the injury. When the cops arrived, I gave them my statement. They searched the woods. About an hour later, I got a call saying that two men had been pulled over and arrested several miles away for reckless driving. One of them had severe dog bites on both legs. Groucho went to the vet and got bandaged up. Fortunately, he's been perfectly fine ever since. I've never heard any follow-ups pertaining to the arrest after, but the whole situation still amazes me. Getting to our house in the woods is not an easy two-minute hike. These men would have had to walk a good 20 minutes through the thick forest in full clown makeup and costume just to get close enough to see our house in the first place. All for the sake of pranking and terrorizing my family, who was just minding their own business? Their motives are completely lost on me. The more research I did on this whole clown thing, the more I think it was some kind of test or initiation, and not just something bored people were doing to pass the time. They put real effort into stalking us, and ultimately were rewarded with a severe dog attack. I think they got pretty lucky, though. Fortunately, I've never seen another clown on my property since. This is going to sound a little bit far-fetched, but I wouldn't be telling it if it wasn't true. It was by far the most terrifying night of my life, and I'll remember it forever. I was 17 years old, and just coming to terms with the fact of realizing I was gay. I won't go into too much detail of that whole aspect, but it is relevant to the story. I just tearfully came out to my parents, who thankfully accepted me the day before Halloween. I just tearfully come out to my parents, who thankfully accepted me. The day before Halloween, I came out to my group of friends as well. A few of them looked at me funny when I told them, but the majority were proud of me and hugged me. I was overwhelmed at the amount of love I received during a time of extreme insecurity for me. Well, the next day at school, we were talking about what we should do that night for Halloween. A few people were having parties we could go to. It was also suggested we could go over to one of our houses and watch scary movies as well. I just had a weird and intense couple of days, so I wasn't too stoked about going out. My friends were pretty adamant, though. I should join them and have fun being the person I was hiding away for so long. I was happy to have their support, so I agreed. We went to a party. Everyone was so welcoming and great to me, it was like nothing had changed at all. I was extremely happy. 
We left the party at around 2 a.m., and one of our friends, Dylan, suggested that we head into the woods to the old abandoned farmhouse. That's one of those places teenagers go to party or get high, so we'd all been there before. Only now, it was at night. I really wanted to just get home. Most of our friend group declined, but when I tried, Dylan kept telling me I needed to go. He was having so much fun with me, and we'd have a lot of fun together as well. I looked over towards my best friend Danielle and told her that I'd go if she did. Danielle agreed, which meant we were quickly on our way to that farmhouse. We got there relatively fast. We were inside the building by around 3 a.m. It was pretty structurally sound still and wasn't falling apart by any means. I felt pretty safe in that regard at the very least. Dylan reached into his backpack and pulled out a Ouija board. He started doing this dumb, evil laugh. There were five of us there, and he asked who wanted to play. I'm a pretty superstitious person, so there was no way I was touching that thing. Danielle and the others agreed to play while I watched, though. Dylan was asking some stupid questions like, Will I get laid tonight? And when am I going to die? It was all really dumb, and you could tell he was moving the piece by himself to get the answer he really wanted. It was so blatant, it was like the answer he got to when will I die was a date 500 years in the future. He started bragging about how he was an eternal being or some stupid shit. I tapped Danielle on the shoulder and told her we should just leave. I was pretty surprised when she told me she didn't want to. She was actually having a lot of fun. I just kind of stood there for another hour before the others finally wanted to leave as well. As we were walking out of the farmhouse though, Dylan stopped me as the rest of the group kept on walking. He told me he had left his backpack inside and asked if I could go get it for him. I didn't see why not, so I ran back in and grabbed the backpack. Just as I was heading back for the door, I watched as Dylan slammed it shut. I tried opening it back up, but something was obviously blocking it from opening. The rest of the house was boarded shut, and I was trapped with no way out. I tried my cell phone, but just as expected, it had no service. I started shouting for him to let me out, but he was just laughing and calling me slurs from the other side. He told me I didn't deserve to live, and he hoped I'd die in there. This was exactly what I'd been afraid of. This is why I'd kept it to myself for so long. It was the late 2000s, so being gay was more acceptable than in the past. But the people who hated us still really hated us. I started crying and screaming for help, but we were at least a half mile into the woods, and there was no way anyone would hear me. I didn't know if Dylan was standing outside, but it didn't matter. I couldn't count on him to let me out, obviously. Around 20 minutes went by, and I heard a noise upstairs. It sounded like footsteps. I started to panic. I got this feeling like someone was watching me. It was almost completely dark in this house. I wasn't given a flashlight before coming inside, and my eyes hadn't adjusted to the darkness either, so I couldn't see anything. The footsteps got louder, and I huddled into the corner of the room and scrouched down as much as possible so maybe I wouldn't be seen. I listened as whoever this was made their way down the stairs and closer to me. I had my head shoved into my arms. No matter what, I told myself, I would not look up. I began to shake as the sound stopped right in front of me. I could hear the breathing of whoever it was standing over me. It's not nice to summon demons in someone's house. I wasn't expecting a voice. So when I heard it, I obviously instinctively looked up. It was an obviously homeless man in ratty clothes with matted hair. He smelled horrible. I almost screamed in surprise when I saw him. I'm sorry, sir. My friends were doing that. It wasn't me. I'm really sorry. I looked up at him as I spoke. I didn't dare to stand up. I didn't want to get any closer to this man than I already was. Why are you in my house then? Kids are always coming in here and I hate it. I don't come to your house and summon demons. He sounded relatively calm, but there was an anger in his voice I was picking up on, just slightly. 
I decided to reply to the man in honesty. I would leave, but one of the guys I was with locked me in. I can't get out. That's when he smiled this creepy, almost toothless smile and whispered in my ear, Well, you're not going home. You're mine now. I'll keep you as an offering for all the times people come and vandalize this place. My heart started to race. I got up and shoved my way past him, knocking the man to the floor. I ran up the stairs. I wanted to scream and cry. I could hear him barreling his way after me, screaming that I belonged to him now. I ran into one of the bedrooms and was grateful to see an open window. I thought I could escape from there. I looked down though and noticed the jump was way too far to the ground. As I looked back, I saw the man in the doorway. I had no other choice now. I jumped down and landed hard on my feet. I was pretty sure I had just broken something, but the adrenaline and shock kept me going. I got up and started running. I wasn't going very fast of course, but what mattered was that I was getting out of there. I made my way home and knocked loudly until my mom came to the door. I'd lost my keys and my phone, but I was just happy to be in my own home hugging my mom, knowing that I was safe now. She asked me what was wrong and what happened to me. I was crying too much to say anything though. She told me to take a shower and calm down, then we could talk about what happened. I washed off all the muck and dirt from my body and began feeling a searing pain coming from my ankle. I got out of the shower, got dressed, and told my mom we needed to go to the hospital since I'd definitely broken something on the way there. I told her the full details of everything. She started to cry, not just because she was upset, but because she was so sad I'd had to experience something like that just because of who I am. It turned out I really did break my ankle. I had to wear a cast for like two months or something. My mom called the police on Dylan and reported him to the school. He wasn't arrested or charged with anything, but he was expelled, which I was very thankful for. No man was found in the old farmhouse though, and it was torn down only a month later, when the owners of the property agreed it garnered too much attention from the wrong crowd. It was becoming a bit of a safety issue. It's over a decade later now, and I still get goosebumps when I think about that night. You'll be happy to know I've been living very happily as myself for quite some time now. I've been married to an amazing person, and we're expecting a son to a surrogate very soon. I'm happy I'll be able to raise a man who will be a good person. There's just no way though he'll be allowed to stay out late Halloween nights. I'm going to tell you the most traumatic story of my life in great detail here, so please don't judge too much. May 2016. I'm a 24-year-old single girl hanging out on a dating app. I was talking to a guy who we'll call M, who I'd been getting along well with for a few weeks. We ended up deciding to meet at a public park. On the day of this date, M arrived in a suit with a box of my favorite cakes in his hands. It was that little attention to detail he had retained from a previous conversation. He really pulled out all the stops. The evening went by and everything seemed to be going well, but I could feel that something was bothering me. His phrases and mannerisms. There was something in my instincts telling me to be careful about this guy. I told him his suit was quite nice. His response was brief and very curt. Thank you. It's the costume I wore to the funeral of my friend's mother. Okay, that's weird. But the bond we had created virtually told me to hang on a little longer. I wouldn't be stopped just because of something slightly weird. We decided to meet again. Not on Monday. I'm always busy. I can't tell you more at the moment, but decide a time and I'll come. I insisted, but he didn't want to tell me what was going on. We started to see each other regularly after, and the relationship took on a more serious tone. I'd sometimes try to find out more about his Monday unavailability, but he left it a complete mystery. Strangely enough, that gave him a little bit of charm. 
After we spent our first night together, though, I noticed that M started becoming quite strange. I woke up at night and I'd see him sitting on a table, staring at me in the darkness while smoking a cigarette, his eyes completely fixed on me without blinking. Aren't you going to sleep? No, I'm an insomniac. Besides, you're so beautiful when you're sleeping, I can't look away. I spent three nights at his place, and it was the same scenario each time. One day, he handed me a book in which he had written down more than 400 questions about me. They were all numbered and tiered by importance as well. He said I had to answer them by writing in next to them. At one point, I noticed a small box at his house as well. I opened it and found cigarette butts, mine, still with traces of my lipstick on them. There were also piles of my hair. He had been picking up and gathering all the hair I was shedding at his place over time. We had only been dating for three weeks now. M was getting attached way too quickly for my liking, and his questionable behavior was really starting to scare me. I decided to breach the subject and tell him I'd prefer if we leave it there. Taken by surprise, he decided to tell me about why he couldn't be around on Mondays. He had been diagnosed with a serious mental illness. I have my file here, you can look at it. Every Monday I go to a support group. I'm under supervision because I'm considered unstable. I decided not to examine his file any further. It didn't really seem appropriate to me. My decision had already been made anyway. I grabbed my things up. And honestly, I felt more and more like I was in danger being with him any further. All of a sudden, as I was turning to leave, M just lost his temper. He started making these wild noises. He started screaming. He began throwing knives all around the room. This ended with him bashing his head over and over with the teapot. Here I was in front of this guy who was clearly going delirious. I tried to calm him down. He sat down on the ground all of a sudden and told me one of the worst things I'd ever heard in my life. He looked down at the ground and avoided my eyes. You know, if I had to kill someone one day, I would cut open their stomach, wrap their insides around my wrists, then gouge out their heart and eat it. He raised his head and smiled at me. The look in his eyes was so unnerving. I really thought I was about to be living my last moments. I ran and locked myself in the bathroom and called his best friend on his phone. He arrived ten minutes later and convinced M to stand down. He was apparently a regular at the psychiatric hospital who was being reintegrated because his condition had improved, but he decided not to take his medical treatment when he was outside the structure. The story does not end there. M started to really harass me from the hospital where he was being interned. According to him, I was followed by the mafia who was at his orders. He sent me videos of himself singing absurd threatening things and telling me over and over he would find me and kill me. He sent me photos of his self-harm and threatened to kill himself if I didn't come back. He'd send me videos trying to make me believe he was dying after having cut his veins and doing crazy stuff like that. He ended up scaring the hell out of me by telling me that while he was out of the hospital, he had been following me, and he'd found out where I lived. He was able to really put the fear in me by telling me about the very beautiful tree in my garden. There was a huge cherry tree at my house that was very notable. Soon after, his notebook was found. There was an incalculable amount of information about me, according to the words of his friend who contacted me later. I filed a complaint and the policemen tried to put pressure on him. It didn't really work, though. I changed my number and no longer contacted anyone close to him. For five years, I frequented the streets in my city with fear in my stomach of meeting him once again. I have stumbled into him twice, but I've always managed to hide before he noticed me. My father contacted his mother to find out more, and she admitted that she and her daughter had moved away because they were so scared of him. Three years later, he sent me a super creepy email telling me he'd never forgotten the first day he saw me, and every night he slept with me. It was a nightmare. I regularly had nightmares about him, where he killed everyone in my family. 
I developed a habit of typing his first and last name into the Google search bar because I was convinced that one day he would do someone harm. Three months ago, I did my search as usual when I came upon his obituary. I don't know the exact circumstances. Honestly, I felt a lot of pain for him and his family because despite all that he'd done to me, I remembered that above all he was an ill person and it was debatable how much control he had over his actions. I want to emphasize that you should be very careful about who you meet on dating apps. I can't say it enough. Always be on guard, because even if your virtual contact goes well, you never know how it could be when you get in person. This story comes from Belgium and took place in 2020 during COVID confinements. I was 20 back then. At the time, because of the severity of the pandemic, the law stated you could only go out to practice sports or to work. I took up the habit of meeting with a friend named Sully to go out for runs and practice all kinds of sports in general. Both of us were quite fond of urban exploration and knew a spot in the outskirts of Brussels consisting of an old sports and wellness center. We took up the habit to hang out there after our runs. To get to that spot, you must go through a hole in a fence on the street, cross a small portion of woods, and you'll come to a football pitch and tennis courts. Up on a hill at the center is an old four-story building. On that day, we had just finished a five-kilometer run and went to our spot as usual. We were walking to the building, since it was about to rain, when we saw two teenagers sitting on the roof's edge. I remember thinking it really bothered me, since we had been planning to go to the roof as well. Instead, we went to the hall area to wait for a bit in hopes these people would leave. In the hall area, you have a clear view into the kitchen, which you must go through if you want to go to the roof. You can also see into another small hall and the dining room as well. Sully was rolling himself a cigarette while I was gathering two chairs and a table for us to sit at. This next part still gives me chills to this day. As I finished setting everything up, I remember starting to feel unwell. It felt as if I was being watched and not in a good way. That's when I looked over to the kitchen, and for a brief moment, I saw a head sticking out of the door frame and staring right at us. It was a man. I couldn't say what age he was. He was all dirty. The one thing I remember is that he had an over-exaggerated happy expression on his face, as if he'd just found exactly what he was looking for. At that moment, I froze there, unable to react bravely to the situation. I leaned slowly towards Sully, all whilst keeping eye contact with the man. I told him very calmly that we had to go right now. I tend to make lots of jokes to all my friends, and especially Sully, but when he saw the look on my face when I told him we had to leave, he didn't say a single word. He grabbed his backpack and stood up. We ran to the football pitch and saw that the two teenagers were still on the roof. We started to yell at them, asking if the man was with them or if they'd seen him. They answered that they hadn't seen anyone and had come by themselves, so if someone was there, he was not with them. We quickly told the teenagers they needed to leave with us as well, since we didn't know what the man in the lobby was up to. They told us they would be fine and they would leave a bit later though. We decided to leave, since we'd already told them what we'd seen. Plus, we'd already been out for very long, so it wasn't very legal with confinement rules. As we were walking towards the woods, I turned back. I could swear I saw the silhouette of the man, standing in front of the staircase leading to the roof. My mind didn't quite react. I just left alongside my friend. I was so shocked that I just decided not to talk about it to anyone in fear of them not believing me or possibly making fun of me. My friend Sully is the only one who was there. He didn't get a good look at the man, but he was just as scared as me seeing by my own reaction at the time. I don't know what happened to those teenagers. I found some local articles and papers dating from around that time. 
about a couple of teenagers being chased by a crazy man in an abandoned building. But the information given wasn't enough for me to be sure it was the exact same situation and the same story. 